So we have networks that are broken down into different VLANs. So we will have a group of switches that are linked together via trunk ports that provide connectivity for VLANs across different physical distances. So on the screen we have VLAN 10 on switch 1 and they will be able to reach host B on switch 2 which is also in VLAN 10. So switches are layer 2 devices and they operate at the data link layer of the OSI model. Although a switch has many capabilities, their core functions are to learn forward and then to avoid loops. So switches make all their switching decisions based on the destination MAC address in the header of the received frame. So on the screen now we have the same switches, switch A and switch B, but the hosts now are in different VLANs. We have VLAN 10 and VLAN 20. Now because layer 2 switches don't forward layer 2 frames between VLANs, a network must use a layer 3 router to route IP packets between subnets to allow those devices in different VLANs and subnets to communicate. So you could think of a VLAN as giving you a little bit of security to make sure you put hosts in the same VLAN that have the same security level. So why wouldn't put a critical database server into the same VLAN as a front end web end server? So Ethernet defines the concept of a VLAN, while IP defines the concept of an IP subnet. But keep in mind that a VLAN is not equivalent to a subnet. So in summary, before we move to the next section, two devices in different VLANs to communicate, routers must connect to the subnets on each VLAN, and then routers forward IP packets between devices in those subnets. So we have IP routing, which is the forwarding of IP packets that delivers packets across the TCP IP network from a device that initially builds the IP packet to the device that is meant to receive the packet. So in other words, IP routing delivers packets from a sending host to a destination host. So for this to work, we need a couple of things. This process requires layer three logic on the routers by which the routers compare the destination address and the packet to the routing tables to decide where to forward the IP packet next. So the routing table is on each device and shows all of the destinations the router knows about. And it can learn these destinations dynamically via routing protocol or you can do this statically yourself. So routing protocols do bring a lot of benefits such as good convergence and summarization in large networks. So I would prefer to have all of my destinations learnt via dynamic routing protocol. So the routing protocol relies on data link and physical details at each link in the network. So IP routing relies on serial WAN links, Ethernet WAN links, Ethernet LANs, and many other networks to implement this data link and physical layer standards. So these lower layer devices and protocols, they move around these IP packets around this TCP IP network by encapsulating and transmitting the packets inside data link layer frames. So before we wrap up, I just want to look at one quick IP forwarding example. So we have a number of steps involved here. So firstly, what if the destination is local? Well, in this case, we can just send it directly. So we find the destination host MAC address. We can use an already known ARP table entry or we can send some ARP messages to learn its information. We then need to encapsulate IP packet in a data link frame where the destination data link address is of the destination host. We have another scenario. What if the destination is not local? Well, in this case, we send it to a default gateway. So the first step would be to find the default gateway's MAC address. So we can use already known ARP table or we can send ARP messages to learn this information similar to the above step. We then, similar to the above step, encapsulate IP packet in a data link frame with the destination data link address of the default gateway. So as you can see, the key difference is the use of a default gateway for destinations that are not local. You could, if you want, have a default route pointing to the default gateway so that all non-local traffic that you don't know about goes straight to the default gateway. The default gateway could then have a routing protocol that can learn all of the other destinations. So on the LAN side of things, you may use OSPF as a routing protocol, but on the WAN you want to use something different like border gateway protocol. So just to summarize what we just spoke about, we have a network, and to simplify things, 
we were going to divide this network into different segments, then we need to have a routing protest carried out by the routers responsible for sending data from one segment to another network in another segment. And it doesn't do this at random, by the way. It takes a chosen path based on a routing process. And here we can have, for example, a routing protocol that can give this routing process all the information it needs. So the router is responsible for routing information to the destination network, and it uses information stored in its routing table. So a routing table is a list of destination networks that reside in memory on the router, and the router uses information to identify where to send data to reach a particular destination. So if a destination is not included in a routing table, the router cannot send information to that destination. So in these case, it might be a good idea to have a static default route pointing to the default gateway to catch all traffic.